Hi everyone, my name is Emma Belknap and I'm a research assistant for the Book of Mormon Art Catalog. Today we're lucky enough to be joined by Julie Frederick. Uh, Julie Frederick received a master's degree in comparative studies from BYU back in 2008. Since then, she has been raising her four kids with her husband, Nick. She loves existential philosophy, Kierkegaardian irony, and scriptural exegesis. She teaches in the religion department at BYU as an adjunct. To date, her most significant accomplishment is that all four of her children are still breathing, are fed every day, and almost always wear clean clothing. And I think all of those are great accomplishments. They are, and I'm telling you, the clean clothing, yes. it, it really is, <laughs> it, it is an accomplishment. Yes, so. well thank you so much for making the time to be here today. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, so today with uh, the Come Follow Me curriculum, we're gonna be talking about Alma 56 through 63. And we're talking about it in reference to the beautiful painting featured behind us. Uh, this painting was actually submitted as part of the Book of Mormon art contest that we ran in 2023. Uh, the piece is called Anti-Nephi-Lehi Mother and Her Stripling Warrior. It was submitted by Sierra Newbolt, painted in 2021. Um, so just to start out our conversation, I wanted mm -hmm. to read a scripture from Alma 56. Helaman is talking to these young men and is asking them like, do y'all feel okay about this? We don't have to do this. <laughs> Uh, and I love their response in verses 50, sorry, 47 through 48 of chapter 56. It says, They had been taught by their mothers that if they did not doubt, God would deliver them. And they rehearsed unto me the words of their mothers, saying, We do not doubt, our mothers knew it. And there's so much power in that, not yeah. doubting that their mothers knew it, so they knew it as well. Yeah. Um, can you tell me more about how you feel like this artwork interprets that scripture? Yes, um, one of the things I love about it is that it shows a mother when her children are tiny. Yes. So much of the artwork is um, either just the children, just the sons themselves in war, or when their mothers are sending them off. And we kind of miss the fact that if their mothers taught them, it was the 8, 10, 12, 15, 16, even 20 years before that that yes. they were teaching them. So I love this piece for the fact that it shows the mothers when they're actually doing the work that's going to lead to this wonderful story. Yes, and something that I really love about this piece specifically is it, you can tell that this is not a convenient moment for her to be teaching. It looks like she's gathering food or something with that basket. She has her baby strapped to her back and it would really be easy for her to just, whatever is happening here, to just let it happen. Mm -hmm. um, but she's taking that time and, and she's being very intentional about how she's teaching her children as well. Yeah, and I love the fact that there, there are two Yes. This is, when we think of the mothers of the stripling warriors, we kind of think of one mom with one boy. Yeah. Um, but there's enough time in there that probably most of them maybe only one, um, but some of them probably had two or three children or had sisters. The stripling sons had sisters yes. that the mothers were also taking care of. So I love even the possibility in this painting that um, one of the, the baby on her back is a baby daughter and oh, she's, yeah. still, she's still teaching, she's still caring for her children and yes. she may be juggling a lot in yes. addition to just the moment teaching. So can you tell me a little bit more about that context? Yes, I'd love to, because I love the information about the mothers. And I feel like we just lose the storyline because of the way it's interwoven in the text. Yes. The story of the anti nephi Lehites starts in Alma 17. We get mm -hmm. Alma 17 through 20 is King Lamoni, his family, his father, their conversion. Yes. That's extraordinary story um, with Abish and uh, King Lamoni's wife. Yes. And then we have a break. And we come back to it in chapter 23. And from 23 to 28, we get the story of their exodus. We get the story of their persecution. We get the story of them as a people, of yes. the different people coming, gathering into this group. And then we don't hear about them again. Yeah. <laughs> until uh, after chapter 28, we don't hear about them again until chapter 53. Yes. And that's when we get our first peek at the mothers specifically. Mm -hmm. And so it's been a lot of chapters between what actually happened to these women and when we're told how wonderful a job they did with their sons. Yes. And that context I found to be just really extraordinary because so much of our reading, so much of our interpretation, so much of our artwork is about the stripling sons. Um, yes. And when they are described, um, they are described as young men, stripling soldiers, very young, stripling Ammonites, my little sons, young men, and young. Yes. So there is one little time they're called men, but it's actually with the time they're called young men in Alma 53, 18 to 21. And the men part is coordinated with their characteristics, mm -hmm. while the mm -hmm. young men part is coordinated with them actually 
deciding to go to war. Yes. So I think um, just textually speaking, an age range of 12 to 16 is really a better visual image for when they go to war. Mm -hmm. um, and part of the reason I like this piece so much is because um, you can put that piece on the timeline of the anti-Nephi-Lehi history. Yes. Um, so if you have sons who are 12 to 16 going to war in the 26th year of the reign of the judges, then they were born between the 11th and 15th year of the reign of the judges. Mm -hmm. um, and that is kind of really extraordinary. The story as Mormon tells us of these people doesn't have any internal timestamps so much of Mormon's writing does, right? Yes. And we did this, and thus ended the 26th year of the reign of the judges, or the 20th, and then the 18th, or whatever. Yes. But in Ammon's story, in the missionary story, there are zero years referenced. The only reference we have is from outside of that story, um, and it's the sacking of Ammonihah, mm -hmm. because it's actually the same Lamanites who kill the first group, the first slaughter of the anti-Nephi-Lehites. Mm those soldiers are the ones who decide they're upset about killing their fellow um, Lamanites. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who decide to go to Ammonihah mm -hmm. and sack that city. And so we have a coordinating point that yes. that happened in the 11th year of the reign of the judges. Mm -hmm. And again, if you take an age range of 12 to 16, those boys were born between 11th and 15th year of the reign of ju the judges. Mm -hmm. That means their mothers were pregnant with them somewhere around the 10th, somewhere between the 10th and 15th, 10th and 14th. And so you have these women, pregnant, nursing, carrying toddlers, in the absolutely most difficult time of their people's history. Yeah. And so the people of Anti-Nephi-Lehi decide not to take up arms, and the, their fellow Lamanites come against them and, and slaughter them as they kneel and pray. And that's the story we know, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we put it in perspective, that happened before the 11th year. Yes. So sometime 10th year, maybe 9th year, maybe a little bit before. Um, but the mothers of the very, very oldest of the stripling, uh, the stripling sons would have been, they would have been very small at that age. Mm -hmm. Most of them either weren't born quite yet or their mothers were pregnant during oh. that slaughter. Yes. And I think that that makes their sacrifice and what they taught their sons so meaningful to know they most of them lived through that yeah and then they lived through um the the continuing persecution from the 11th year to the 14th to the 13th year so for me um the extraordinary thing about this particular piece is that it shows a moment in that time period mm -hmm. all of these women and some of them may have had one child some of them may have had two some of them may have had you know girls in that same age range mm -hmm. that they were taking care of. But these mothers had at least one child, one small child yeah. during those years of persecution. And I, I like to think that when they teach their sons, it's not just because they know, theoretically, God preserves his people. Mm -hmm. Not because they know if you keep the commandments, you'll be blessed. It's because they lived it. Yes. I mean, in the midst of enemies on both sides, in the midst of no defense, in the midst of having tiny children, um, they were promised preservation, mm -hmm. and they believed. Yeah. And that's those are not just the years that they experienced; those are the years that um, they're going to be referencing as they're teaching their kid. We we really do them a disservice if we don't connect what they experienced to what they taught. Mm -hmm. They experienced. An extraordinary amount of bloodshed, of hardship, of fear, of not knowing if they were ever going to be safe, if they mm -hmm. were ever going to be accepted. Mm -hmm. Having to pick up your whole family and just move into territory that theoretically should be friendly because they have a treaty, because the Ammon arranged it, mm -hmm. but you have no idea if practically it's going to work out. Yes. And so I just love the the image, the idea that these, mo these women, these mothers, they, they are teaching their sons, they're teaching their families amidst this very, very difficult time. And by the time we actually learn what they teach, we've kind of lost their story. Yes. But when we finally get there, um, what they teach their sons seems to be directly related with the preservation they experienced with their trust in the Lord that he can deliver a people mm -hmm. out, of, out of the hands of enemies um, and that they have the faith 
um, and they teach their sons. A connection that I made while you were talking that I hadn't made before is there's the idea of the Lord telling them you're going to be preserved and how you consistently see that they were preserved when they went to the, the Nephites and, and how the sons were their means of being preserved at this moment, how the Lord kept providing a way for this to happen and in ways that I imagine they didn't expect. Yeah. Um, and in ways that would have been really hard to keep trusting in him. I can't, <laughs> yeah. I know you're a mother. I, I, I don't yeah. know if you can imagine what it would be like sending off a small child oh my or um, a teenager. You know, you think of the moms sending their kids off to missions, right? And we yes. kind of have this culture of the moms all know, like this is going to be difficult and stressful. I mean, can you imagine the comparison yeah. of sending your son off to war? Yes. Just Go fight. Yeah, you're 12. With no training. Go have fun. Yeah, you're, no training, no promise, yeah. um, and just faith. Yes. Um, and, and that the sons credit their mothers with saying, yeah, that's the reason we knew. We knew the reason we kept the commandments is because of what, what they taught. The yeah. reason we have the faith is because of who they were. Yeah. Our mothers were brave enough to let us be here mm -hmm. so we can be brave enough to stay. Yeah. That's, that's a beautiful way of saying it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've touched on this a little bit already, but... I would like to wrap up by asking you to share your personal reaction to this artwork. Um, I just, you know, I just loved it. Yes. It was the only piece I had seen when the children were that small and the yeah. only piece with two of them. And I loved that that spoke to the mother's experience rather than so much focus on the sons and the extraordinary things they did. But this piece, um, it just touched my heart because it so clearly the mother interacting with her son yes. years and years and years beforehand. Yeah. Um, and I would love to at some point see like a kind of a companion piece of the mother holding one son and carrying the other, maybe baby daughter and with armies behind, mm. right? And mm -hmm. so you can feel, um, because this is a very kind of idyllic scene and it's yes. beautiful <laughs> and I love it. And um, I also would love to give these women some credit for kind of the pain and suffering mm -hmm. and the fact that it's in the midst of that pain and stress and suffering that they are still teaching their sons. Like you said yes. at the beginning, that they are taking taking the moments so that their children, their sons know who they are and what it means to be part of a covenant, what it means to be part of a faith that believes, what it means to keep commandments, what it means to, to trust in the Lord when all evidence to the contrary, yeah, all evidence says, uh, you're not going to make it. Yes. Um, and they chose to trust instead. And I yeah. love that. I feel like that's that's depicted with this mother and her trust that they're going to they're going to find a way. The Lord is going to preserve them. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a lovely place to wrap up with our discussion. And I know that uh, a lot of what you talked about here today, and especially the timeline of the mothers, that comes from research that you've been doing that you recently presented at a conference. And where can people find that? Where is that coming out if they want to learn more? Um, I originally did this research that turned into the conference presentation yes. um, from um, a paper I was doing for a volume called Quiet Disciples. Mm. And the mothers of the stripling sons just fit right in because they're people who are very much there, but kind of you have to go looking for them to find their story. Yes. Um, and so I wrote this little piece about the mothers of the stripling sons um, for a volume. It's called Quiet Disciples. I think the one that all, has all women examples is coming out for Mother's Day next year, and there will be another one with father's examples coming out, I think, at Father's Day. Fantastic. So. Lovely. Well, I'm not sure if when this is released, that'll already be out. Oh, that's true. But if it <laughs> is, you should go read that and learn more about um, Julie's research. And uh, again, thank you so much for joining us. We hope that this was enlightening to your study of uh, Come Follow Me this week and that you've been able to learn more about um, discipleship and about, I think, especially the power that quiet discipleship has. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you so much.